Okay, so today we're talking about specific pre-processing algorithms for the AFI matrix chip, and we're and we're talking about this uh, because it the ideas apply not just for this chip but in others, and you will and also um, a lot of people have asked me to talk about this and, and present some of the details. So today's lecture is, is more detailed than previous ones but m much more focused than previous lectures. All right, so to understand what, what, why this is difficult and what it involves, we, we first have to understand how the technology works. And we went over this in a previous lecture. We're going to briefly talk about it today again just to put everybody on the same page. So this is the, the line up here. That line represents the, the transcript. And this is the three prime end of the of the transcript. See this little this this hole represents uh, the the fact that this is actually much longer. It keeps going, and this is sort of the end towards the end of the transcript. Uh, and then you, we have the probes are represented with these little lines. So there's eleven probes, and they're matching this section of the of the transcript. This one matches this section, etc. Then you have the the PMs, which have one different. Uh, base. We are not going to use that today, We're but I'm showing it anyways. And then down here, what I'm showing in this, this little triangle, I'm blowing it up and is, so you can see what, what this is in terms of bases. Here's, a, here's the, the transcript as it will be in the, on the chip. And this, this down here is the probe, the 25 sequences that make the probe. Right, so you can see that it's a perfect match to the transcript. The MM is not a perfect match because it has one difference base here. So down here, I'm showing you the what you kind of will see on the array. You'll have a little cell, the feature that will light up if this transcript is there, and the MM shouldn't light up as strong because it has a mismatch. That's a cartoon representation. In the cartoon, they're all next to each other. That's not the case in in the in the actual array. On the actual array, they're they're spread out randomly or haphazardly to avoid spatial effects ruining everything which happened in the early versions of the chip okay so that's what the data is. so we have for every gene 11 numbers 22 if you include the MNs we're not going to talk about the MNs we're not using them in this lecture so it's 11 numbers per gene per sample okay, so then we we need to remember that we're going to have several samples that we're doing case and controls, we will have some replicates for each, so we'll have, you know, between six and hundreds of samples. All right, so here's the data illustrating the probe effect again, but now, when we showed this earlier, it was related to background. We, sh we, show we showed how the how different probes have different background levels. Today, we're showing how different probes have different affinities to actual signal. And this picture, this is one of the first probe effect pictures that I saw it was made by Cheng Li and Wing Wang in, in their first paper on, on, the, on the subject. And this is not the exact picture they show, but it's like this. Uh, so but what I'm showing is for, this, for the spiking experiment, I picked two samples. So I have sample red and sample blue. And for each one, I'm showing uh, a gene. This is one, one gene only where each... Um, for, for, the, for each gene, I'm showing the values for each probe on the two samples. So that's why we have, in this case, it's 16. This is one of the older chips. It had 16 probes instead of 11. So we have 16 probes, and you can see the probe effect very clearly. Right? Why, why do I say that the probe effect is very clear? What do you, what, give me one very quick example of what really demonstrates the probe effect here. Um, which one? 11 and 13 is a good one, right? So this, this one, they're the same transcript. They're supposed to be measuring the same thing, yet this guy is about 8 times bigger. Actually, close to 16 times bigger than that one. So same, they're measuring the same thing, yet they're very different in what they show. Now, why do we call it a probe effect and not just measurement error? So if you look at the, at the blue gene, at the blue sample, the same thing happens again. It's... it's it is consistent. That that's what actually makes it okay. So the probe effect 
is there every time. So the difference between the two samples is, is correct. If you take the difference between 8 and 4, you get the right answer at pretty much every probe. If you go probe by probe, every time, you get the difference of about 1, which is the right answer because I, I forgot to say this. The 4 is the, num the amount of spiking in this sample, and 8 is the amount of spiking in the other one. So it's, it's twice as much in one versus the other, which is why you should get a difference in the log scale of about 1. So if you go pro by pro, just move, or, move your eye, you'll see that every time the difference is, about, about, is correct. So the, the pro effect is, in that sense, is not really a problem. In, if you're compu computing relative expression, it will cancel it, itself out. Now here's, a, here's a, a similar picture. We saw this earlier. This is showing us, instead of two arrays, it's showing us 11 arrays or something, or more than one, right? So every point in the curve is a different array. Right, so you can see different points, and the the uh, different colors are the different probes. So this is just one. Each column of points is one array, and then we start going up in spiking amounts, and you can see that it starts going up each one. And as was pointed out in a in the in a previous lecture, these guys are close to parallel lines, which is good. It's good that they're all going up. That's good. That means they're all detecting signal. They're parallel. The fact that they're far away is due to the probe effect. But you can see it's consistent. They, 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 it's consistent across chips. OK, so what, what does all this matter? Why am I telling you all this? So if you want to, if you want to the, the, the knowledge that there is a probe effect actually helps quite a bit. And it's, the reason it helps is because it helps you detect outliers, which in these chips, there's a lot of outliers. So why do I say that? I'm going to explain why that is. Why is it that knowing about the probe effect helps detect outliers? So here is a model. This is the model we're going to use for this, um, for this data. This is the RMA model. It's very simple. It's just a linear model. So you, we're going to take the PMs in the log scale. And we're going to assume that they have a array effect for this. This is for one gene. So each gene gets this, a model like this fitted to it. And then has a probe effect represented by B and then an error represented by epsilon. So in this model, as a statistician, we're thinking of these two as fixed effects right now. And then this is a random. This is random. So this is measurement error. These are, these are there. They're constant. We're going to estimate them. So if you have one gene, there's 11 probes, how many parameters do we have if we have one sample? Can you count how many, how many par parameters? So these two are called parameters in statistical language. They're, they're, they're going to be estimated. This one is not. This is, just, this is error. We're gonna, we're gonna, we know it's there. We're going to estimate these two as best we can, given that the error is there. So if we have one sample, we have 11 probes. How many total parameters do we have? There's 12, um, there's 12 parameters, right? 12 parameters. How many data points? How many data points? We have 11 probes, so we, so we have 11 data points. So we have 20, 12 parameters and 11 so if you have if you know just a little bit of linear algebra and statistics, you know that's not good. You can't estimate. It's just it's gonna be overfit. You can't get an answer. So well you can get an answer, but it won't be a good one. So this model doesn't work on one chip. On one, it, you need to have various chips, various arrays. That's what the M is for. Multi array. Um, so if I have 100 samples, now the number of parameters is 111, but I have thousands of data points, right? Because I have a table that has 11, right? well, I have 1,100 sample data points, and now I can fit it. So the, the power comes from assuming that the probe is fixed. It's the same in every sample, so I'm going to borrow, I'm, I'm borrow data across samples to estimate the probe effect. So to fit this, you can in R, there's many ways of fitting this. 
but we're going to do it robustly. What does that mean? I'm, I'm going to explain that in a second. So here's, here's what it comes down to. Here's what the advantage of, of this multi-array model approach, uh, why it helps. And, I've, and this idea has, I, we have applied to other technologies, so this is why I, I, I do explain it, even though not everybody's going to be working on pre-processing AFI chips. So here, here's some data um, from, this is real data, this is not fake data. I have, I've included only five of the probes so that, so that the, the plot isn't as busy. Okay, so I'm showing you uh, the results of uh, computing the mean or the median, the median, the median. So I have five probes for each sample. And I can take the median of those five numbers and compute it. That is what the black circles are. So there's, there's, there's 40 some arrays. For each array, this is one gene, I'm taking the median of the five points and I'm seeing that it's always about the same except this one guy. That one, that one guy is different from the rest. You see that, how that guy's different? Now, this, this particular sample comes from this data. Now, these are technical replicates. So this is a, this is an out, this is a, a false positive. It shouldn't be different. But it's quite different from the rest. So what do you think is going on here? Why one of these numbers maybe, or, or all of them, uh, may be an outlier? Something that just went wrong. Can you tell which one it is? Which which one of these do you think is the outlier? Two. Well, you think it's two, but it, after I think is five. All right. So the, if you if you just look at one array, it's impossible to tell. If you look at all the data at once, then it's pretty obvious. So see, the two is 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 different, but it's always high because that, that it has a high probe effect. That's fine. There's no problem with two. Number one, it's always the same, no problem with one. But five shouldn't be there. Sh five should be here. And by moving up, it moved the whole, the whole thing up and gave us a mistake. Just that one little error made the whole thing seem wrong. Now, the gray diamond is RMA. It uses something called medium polish, which is a estimation procedure invented by um, Tukey, John Tukey, a long time ago, and it still works well. Uh, there's other ways to estimate parameters in a what we statisticians call robust way. That means don't let the outliers move things up and down. So the median is a robust approach, but it didn't work here because it, because it wasn't aware of the probe effect. So you need, in this case, we need a procedure that is robust in two ways. It's robust across the probes and across the samples. That's what medium polish does. There's other, there's other things you can do. You can, you can implement one of the many robust procedures that statisticians have developed for fitting linear models. The, there's a function in R called RLM, Robust Linear Model, and it will work just the, pretty much the same. Medium polish is faster, and that's what we ended up using. Um, more recently, we've been using ro the robust approaches because of um, issues with uh, weighing probes differently. I I'm going to get to that when I talk about fRNA. All right, so that's, that's the principle of why we like using the multi-probe ar array. And that's basically what RMA does in the... In the um, in the summer, what we call the summarization step, where it takes the 11 probes into one number, it fits this model to the entire data set across many samples. So, the RMA, the algorithm, was a combination of doing background correction in the way we described earlier. It was it uses quantile normalization, and then it ends with this robust medium polish approach. So those three steps. Are the, are the three steps in what today people call RMA, and it's the way it's implemented in Bioconductor and other pieces of software, that's what it does. So it's, it became a very popular approach to summarizing Affymetrics data. And it, it, some people just consider it the default. A lot of the data in GEO is RMA processed. It, it'll say, it should say it. 
sometimes, I don't know if they always say it, sometimes it's just there. If the numbers are between 4 and 16, it was RMA. If, it, if they're between, um, well, I don't know what the other numbers are, but usually when they're between 4 and 16, it usually means it was done with RMA. Okay, so AFI matrix expression arrays are typically processed with, these, with this approach. Now, today, a lot of people, now that we, kind of, we have kind of figured out microarrays today in 2012, finally, and now people are trying to actually use them for diagnostics and clinical <coughs> applications. Like there's, there's, a, there's a procedure called Mama Print, which was developed using microarrays, and it's been sold. And there's another one called, I think it's OncoDX, that is also developed with microarrays, and it's also being sold. So now they're finally used, being used to, to do real like, clinical translational stuff. So people wanting to, to take a mi microarray data and, and convert it into a diagnostic, where you give them your RNA, and they put it on a chip, and you get an answer, can't use RMA because it needs to work on a single chip. I just explained why we use all these, we have to use all these samples, and we can't do that here. We can't take one, uh, we can't apply it to one sample. It doesn't work. So the, the FRMA is the answer to that problem. And the F stands for frozen. And what is frozen? What we freeze? are the probe effects and the normalization uh, distribution to which quantum normalization normalizes to. So this is the idea. You, you, we take all the data that's out there in the, uh, in the public domain. For, a, for, a given, for every given chip, we have to do this, because every chip has a different set of probe effects. So you get all this data. Now you have thousands of arrays. Now you can take, uh, and we're going to use that in a second. We can background correct each chip at once. That is not multi-chip. The, the background procedure I have described here are all performed on one, just one chip. So that's not a problem. We can do that. Now, quantum normalization, remember when we, we described it last Tuesday, the way we, we get the, dis the final distribution is we average across all the arrays. We, if we just have one, we can't quantile them. There's nothing to quantile normalize to. So what we do is we take the, the, la the, the database, and from the we quantile normalize the database, and we keep the distribution that these arrays will have. At the end, they all have the same distribution, and we keep it. We keep it in a file. Now, with a new chip, we quantile normalize it so that the Quantiles of the new array are the same as the one we froze, that we, so, that we saved. So that's, that's taken care of. Now we have, we have background corrected. We have normalized one chip. Now the final step, we have, to, we have to account for the probe effect. But we can't compute the probe effect with just one chip. But we can compute it if we have a database. So we compute it on the database, and we freeze that, those numbers. And we keep those. And now we can do RMA with one chip. That's what FRMA is. So here, that's what I just described. OK, so a couple of interesting things we found while, while doing this, which we now use to our advantage. This is a, this, this is a plot of the standard deviation across all the um, chips. So we have 1,000 chips. We fit the RMA model. And then we have the, res we have the residuals. And we can compute the standard deviation of those residuals. This is the these, these are the this is a histogram of the twenty thousand standard deviations you get one for each gene. So one of the things we, we saw that we weren't quite expecting is that th there's this heavy tail. See how th this is what we expect to see, you know, kind of a, a chi square looking thing. But then this is t this tail is longer than than we that you expect if. The data just typically behaves like you would expect. So these probes that are out here are probably just bad probes. They just move around too much. So we might as well get not use them. So we tag those by actually by weighing them using their, their, their pre-estimated standard deviation. So here's an example of one of those guys. These are the residuals. So you, you can see there's several arrays. Each column of points is an array. And we have, um, for each column, we have about 11. Well, we don't have about. We have 11 points. 
those are the 11 probes that we got on each array. And notice the red, the red one is, is behaving very weirdly. We shouldn't, we shouldn't even bother using that one. We don't. We just remove it. That's just an example of a bad behaving probe. And we don't, but again, one thing that we should point out, you don't see this until you look at data across many, many samples. All right, so um, a bigger problem, actually, has to do with the batch effect. So from the big databases, we can get several examples where you have the same tissue hybridized by different labs. And what we can do is we can, we can compute an F statistic for, the bas for, for each probe that has a batch effect. Uh, that, that probes that move across batches will have a big F statistic. And again, we see a pretty long tail. That's because some probes appear to be more susceptible to whatever it is that's causing the batch effect. Here's an example of one of these probes. This is, these are residuals from, again, this is just like the previous plot. There's 11 points because there's 11 probes for, for several arrays. And now we've divided up into, into studies. So you can see with the dashed lines, you can't, they're kind of faint, but there's these dashed lines here that divide study 1, study 2, study 3, study 4, study 5, and study 6. And you can see how the, the, the entire residual cloud moves dramatically from lab to lab. And that's not, this is, a, this is a bad probe, not all probes do this, but this one is very, very susceptible to the batch effect. This is another one that's a candidate for just removal. Um, it's not, it's, it's, it, it might just make things worse to include it. So uh, here is, a, this is an example uh, showing um, another issue with, with RMA. This is what people have complained about using it in, in batches. So if you, if you normalize a group of, of arrays, so here's, I didn't mention this earlier, so I'll mention it now. Another reason, uh, groups don't use RMA is because they have a big operation and they're constantly adding <coughs> results to a database. So they keep adding, adding, adding. So if you're going to use a multi-chip approach, you would have to rerun it every time. You add a new array, run the whole thing. New array, whole thing, whole thing. You keep doing it. Or maybe you can do it by, you can do it by groups instead. But if you do it by groups, then batch effects would be introduced from the pre-processing. So the, the statistical approach was introducing a batch effect, and that's what, that's what this is. This is a data set. It's a nice data set. It was produced in one lab where they have, whoops, sorry, where they have two of, e of several tissues. They have two biological replicates. So you can see here's, here's liver two, and here's liver one. So what I did is I separated them out into two, into two groups. Right? There's the, just, just, randomly into two groups, but each group has one of each tissue. And we pre-process them together, and when you, when you compute the correlation between these samples, you can see a very strong batch effect. See how there's high correlation here with this group and here, but not, not across. That's basically a batch effect introduced by the pre-processing. Here, red means high correlation, yellow and white mean low correlation. Now, if you do FRMA, that completely goes away, completely and, well, almost completely, and then you have these squares. Now, you have these new squares that weren't there before, uh, and it, but those squares do make sense. These are all brains. See, lobe, lobe, spinal cord, well, nervous system, I should say, thalamus. Yeah, so this is all brain, this is all nervous system. And then here, what is this? Is this a real thing? Uh, maybe not. Can anybody see if that makes sense? I don't know what I can't see what this is here. Tongue? No, no, that might just be an artifact. Ovary and skin? Yeah. Nothing. All right. So there's these are these are the papers that you can read to um, learn more about these approaches. They're very specific to AFI, but I, I think the idea is can be used in other situations. Okay, so any questions? Yeah. Okay, 
what is the what is the main difference between RMA and FRMA? So the model that I showed very early on. Okay, this one. The B is the bat is a probe effect. The pro to, to estimate the B, you need to see it more than once. So to see it more than once, you need to see several samples. So let's say you have one sample. You can't this this is how we start this. You can't estimate B. You would have to, you would have twelve parameters and eleven points. So I would I need to have several samples, at least two, but it's better to have more to estimate B and then, and then once you can estimate B then you can detect outliers like this one right because because to know that this is an outlier you need to know that B for for five is this much right so B one so think I'm gonna use that that index B1 B2 B3 so what's B1 B1 is about six point six all right, B2 is about 7.25. B3 is 6 to 5. B4 is 6.1. And B5 is, no, it's not this, B5 is 5.6 or whatever. So once you know that B is that low, then you know this is an outlier. But how did I estimate B from seeing all these? So if you, if you just have one sample, you can't do that. So RMA gets B from this data. FRMA got B already from before, from a database, and it kept it. So it doesn't need these guys again. So I, I would hope that at the end you get the same answer, but you don't. But that's the point is to get the same answer, but without having to use a big data set, with just just for one array. Now that that is the main the main difference is FRMA works on one sample. RMA, you need several samples. So that means uh, RMA uh, get the training data from, the from, it's from, the, from itself. Yes, that's a very good way to put it. Okay. RMA uses its own da the data you get as a training. FRMA has a separate independent uh, training set. All right, any other questions? Yeah? So I I've I heard people be, that are satisfied with just two. Um, and I, but I don't I have never seen a problem a big problem with when you just have to compare to what the problems you get from using a, a pre-processing algorithm that isn't as as precise. One is with one you get an error. It doesn't even run. But with two, you get, it does run, and it does give sensible answers. So, if you want to use FRMA, there has to be a chip in the database. Yeah, very good question. So, FRMA is not available for all chips. Uh -huh. It's only available for right now. I I think it's I know there's three chips for which we have gone through the trouble of creating the database for people to use. We get requests all the time. Hey, I just I'm using this chip. I'm you know I study plants or Arabidopsis. There's no FRMA for Arabidopsis. So we now created a, a package called what is it called? Oh uh, it has a funny name. Uh, anyways I forgot. But the, I think it's maybe just called FRMA tools. It's the paper that has a funny name. So um, thawing thawing something or other. So so FR, that, that um, tool lets you create the database if you get the data. You have to go get the data and create it. So now anybody can do it if they have the, the patience to download their own big database and run it. But we, we have created three, but I, I think we might have put some more up. But um, yeah, that's a good point. It's not, you, you have to go through all, a lot of work to get to, to that. Other questions? Yeah. Can I use that MRMA if I have only two samples? Yeah, one. That's the point. So, so would it be better to use MRMA if I have only two samples? 
I, I, yeah, we have, we, I, so is it better, if you just have, if you have a few samples, which one should you use? So we haven't done a careful comparison of that, to answer that question. Uh, I, I, I feel more, if you have enough data and you have a very, a self-contained project, I, I, my intuition from what I've seen is that you get slightly better results with RMA. So when, me personally, when I'm working, if I get a data set from a collaborator and they just want to answer this one question and they're done, I'll just use RMA, even if it's six. So when I use FRMA is when someone says, I want to develop a clinical tool that blah, blah, then I use FRMA. Those, that's my own personal situation. That's how I've done it it's th in those two contexts. So if it's a self-contained project, I use RMA. If it's not, then I use FRMA. More questions? Yeah? In the F test distribution, yeah? Um, let's see it again. Here. So you do not, you want, you, you want the null hypothesis to be true. The null hypothesis here is that each, so the way we do this is we, we fit RMA, we have the residuals, and now you test if there's if the variability between studies is zero. That's that's the null hypothesis. You want that. We do not want the residuals to correlate with batch. So having big numbers here is bad. We want them to be down here in the in the in the cloud of of, of non significant stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any spatial correlation to the batch and to the global test? Ah, like yeah. There's a lot. So, um, yes. So, so, first of all, a lot of the ah, it's too bad I don't have. I might do this later. Then, now that you asked, that it reminds me. When you do, there's another step that I haven't talked about, which is quality control. And when you, one of the quality control steps that we, that we use, that we've been using for a long time, is to plot, you, you fit this model, you have residuals. So for each chip, you have epsilon ij half, okay? And you can make, you can make the image, and the, mo the, the, the most common problem that we see when a, when a whole, when a chip seems to be behaving funny, is a big blob of high residuals. So you will see big spatial, like we'll see like drops, what appear to be drops. We see thumbprints a lot. Wait, what was the image data? You take the F, the, you fit this model. Uh -huh. So now you have for, you have epsilon ij half. Oh, so you have so that, okay. you have two hundred thousand epsilon j's, and each one is associated with a location on the chip. Okay. Um, give me a second. I'll show you some of those pictures. I, ha I have them right here. I hope I have them right here. Does anybody see quality? Yep, there it is. Okay, let's see. Yeah, there's a good one. There's a thumb. So those are the residuals. Actually, no, no, these are the, this is the raw data. I'm sorry, that's the residuals, where red is positive and blue is negative. You, that's, I'm pretty sure that's a thumb. Somebody grabbed it the wrong way. Uh, let me see if I have other funny ones. Oh, yeah, this is a good one. This is the raw data. So the, uh, the probe effect doesn't let you see the problem here. Because the, the, there's so much variation across from probe to probe that you see blue, red, blue, blue, I'm sorry, blue, white, blue, white, blue, white, white. But once you fit the model and you keep only the residuals, you see a, um, a I call it the shark mouth. <laughs> what do you think caused that? I don't know what that one is, but here's a thumb. Um, can, uh, let me see if I have more. Yeah, there it is. So here it is. Oh, look at these. So he has the uh, crop circles, the thumb, 
the ring of fire, the French flag, moon shape, arcs, etc. So anyways, that's just some of the things we see. Now a lot of these aren't, so this is, a, if you see this, if you see the thumb, you're, you should remove it. The, this one, you should also remove it. Um, but the, the shark mouth I showed you, that's not a problem. Um, you don't have to get rid of that one because the, 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 the number of probes that are affected are small and it'll be like one and our RMA gets rid of it. Right? It's, but the, when you have a whole thumb, there's the chance that a, that a gene falls in, the, in that image is, is a problem.